So as I was saying, the model in Gnosticism for the descent of the soul, and you can find this worked out uh, also in addition to Macrobius in the classical version in his commentary on the dream of Scipio, you can also find this in the Nag Hammadi library in the Apocryphon of John, which outlines the, the Gnostic version of the model. Macrobius gives the Neoplatonic version. Um, is that you have Saturn as the outermost sphere. Uh, the, the outermost is actually the fixed stars, and above that is the Gnostic Pleroma, the realm from which the souls come. They come through the sphere, the sphere of the fixed stars where they pick up influences from the zodiac. Then as they come through, as the soul drops down through Saturn, in some cases, in the, the, the archetypology differs from system to system, but as it comes through Saturn, it picks up the quality of reason, of rationality, in its monomyakosha aspect, which in German philosophy would be Verstand, the understanding, not Vernunft, not the reason. Reason is linked closer to the Vigyanamayakosha uh, than it is to the monomyakosha, which is mere intellect. What Spengler derides is the intellectual aspect of the civilization phase and the shallowness of the late megalopolitan Isaac Asimovian, Carl Saganian type of intellect. Uh, so Saturn and then the next sphere down is Jupiter, where it picks up its regal qualities, its pride, its haughtiness, its arrogance. Jupiter's always kingly and regal. Then it drops to Mars, where it per picks up its courage. And then it drops down, there's a gap, and the, there's the sun, where it picks up uh, the brilliance of the personality. Then it drops down from that to pick up from Venus its sex drive. And from Mercury, it's intellect, the, the actual real intellect, the, the reason, fairnoot, that which goes in quest of the grand metaphysical ideas. Uh, and then below that, the moon, it picks up the power of the body to grow and become. Since the moon dies and revives, that's like a dying and reviving god in the sky on a monthly basis. Then it picks up in the atmospheric sphere the, the qualities of the four elements, which are also imprinted on it and become the humors which in Greek medical theory, if they become disturbed, then they cause illnesses. So that those four humors that correspond to the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water, have to be set and adjusted in perfect ratios. Otherwise, you become sick. They disturb the physical body, and the soul incarnates in a physical body and builds it. In the Gnostic version of this, the planets become actually, the, the spheres themselves become inhabited by demons called archons, and the archons are these demons that imprint the soul uh, with negative, with all these astrological elements that become a deterministic influence on the individual, and hence are negative. Yaldabaoth is the, the lord of Saturn, and he is Yahweh, transformed as a negative demiurge, who does not know the knowledge of the Platonic forms that are above him, so he's regarded as a secondary god, uh, the god who thinks he's god, but there's actually god beyond him, the realm of the noose. Plotinus' noose, the realm of the ultimate forms. Uh, and he captures and imprisons the soul and uh, basically creates the world as an error, a mistake. And so Gnosticism is extremely pessimistic, but it does have this one idea of escape, that the Hindus have their moksha and their Buddhism, it's nirvana. The one escape here is Gnosis, uh, which is precisely the process of realizing this cosmology that I've just outlined and attaining uh, illumination and liberation from it. So these are the different soul models. They're not compatible very easily, although you can identify, as I just have, between the Gnostic Neoplatonic model and the Hindu model of the sheaths, certain, uh, certain isomorphisms, certain, uh, in the principle of comparative morphology, you can identify homologous structures. Uh, but they're never analogous. They always have different functions. In the West, it's all about dynamism and the personality functioning in the world. In the East, not in China, but in the Indian East, it's about leaving the world, disengaging from it, and, and going off into the forest to attain liberation. So then getting back to this chapter, none of this is discussed in this chapter. I just used it as an occasion for outlining in more detail something which Spengler doesn't do, but which I would appreciate it if he had done in this chapter, is outlining these different soul ideas in the different civilizations. But nevertheless, he does contrast the Homeric uh, Platonic sense of the soul uh, in contradistinction to the dualistic soul of the Magian and to the, the soul as will uh, in the Faustian. Then he moves on to a discussion in the middle of the chapter about how you can see this in the, in the contrast between Greek tragedy uh, and Faustian tragedy, in which in Greek tragedy, uh, everything that befalls the individual simply befalls him in a random way, and he could just as well be anyone else, and it would befall him or her in just the same way. It's a, uh, the, the, the hero suffers in a passive sense, and his soma is always damaged, his physical body is always damaged, and the whole sense of suffering comes to him from this uh, suffering that is inflicted upon his physical body. Whereas in Faustian tragedy from Shakespeare on, 
uh, the tragedy comes from the whole character of the individual. Remember, in the Northern West, uh, what happens to one is a function of one's character. Who you are determines what's going to happen to you in the West. Not so for the Greeks. Uh, but in, in the Northern West, this is of the essence. Um, you can't understand Othello, or what happens to Lear, especially Hamlet, without knowing all these uh, intricate details of his personality and his life history. And this becomes the Faustian tragic myth, uh, and the myth is the tension of this unique individual incarnate in a sp specific set of historical circumstances that uh, provide the tension between what he wants and what he's trying to achieve and that which society uh, limits him in his ability to achieve so that there's always this, this very difficult tension uh, and the essence of the tragedy comes from this conflict between self and the you that is working itself out in Faustian uh, tragedy. So that's the essence of the discussion on uh, the distinction between the two modes of tragedy in the classical mode and in the Faustian mode. And then he says that uh, he finishes this question by saying that our science, our scientific picture also is no more objective than our Faustian soul is and can no more be said to be the real truth of things than the Faustian soul. Uh, the discoveries of Copernicus uh, with the sense of being completely uncomfortable with being bounded inside of a celestial sphere uh, with Copernicus that had to be shattered because uh, what the Faustian soul wants is this expansion through infinite space and consequently our, our model, our cosmological model of this expansion of all these solar systems, jillions of them within the Milky Way and then all of these giant uh, nebulae and galaxies going on and on and on, uh, Spanglish says uh, is very consistent with the Faustian world feeling toward expansiveness. And he says the same thing happens at the same time in the 15th century with the great Portuguese navigators, starting with Henry the, the Navigator, and then moving on through you know, Columbus and Vasco da Gama and Magellan and so forth. They push out into these vast depths in the ocean because there again it's consistent with the Faustian desire to conquer space, to fill it. Uh, space, like I said in the previous chapter, is vaginal. It's, it's a giant womb for the Faustian civilization, and it has to be filled. And, and so there's this restless, yearning desire to constantly populate the space, every ounce, every inch of space, in every domain, in the actual and in the realm of discourse, in the arts as well as in the sciences, to fill it. And, and there's this sense of completion, this need uh, for completion and expanse that the Faustian soul has. It's already evident in the Vikings, uh, Spanglish says, discovering... Uh, moving into Iceland and Greenland and then into North America along about the year 1000. Uh, and the Vikings go everywhere. They actually go up all the way into the Black Sea. Uh, they go everywhere and they're sort of already a, a, a preview of coming attractions of these, these navigations that take place in the 15th century and which lead for the first time in history to a planetary civilization, as Spengler says. The planetary civilization that we're in now we owe to these neo-Vikings of the 15th and 16th centuries who went out and conquered the world the moment America was discovered, Europe became provincial within this new world system, and the civilization became planetary for the first time, consistent with its world feeling, where he says, contrast this with the fact that the Greeks, who had technologies, sailing technologies available to them to go out beyond the pillars of Hercules, weren't interested in doing so, and they would have regarded it as a complete threat to their sense of well-being within a clearly defined, bounded, limited cosmos. The Egyptians had already sailed, and the Carthaginians had already sailed and mapped out the coast of Africa in, in a complete sense all the way around. They had already done this, uh, Spangler says. I don't know about the Egyptians, where, he, where he's getting his resources for that, but the Carthaginians certainly. Uh, but that didn't interest the Greeks. All they were interested in was settling these islands in Magna Graecia and Sicily, and they had a very limited sense of what they did because it was consistent with what they wanted, what they uh, the metaphysical feeling and the Apollinean world soul wanted them to do. They carefully eliminate. So notice then that, <clears throat> again, consistent here with the Faustian model that the soul determines what happens to one. Same thing here for Spengler's model. It's a Faustian model of civilization because what happens to a civilization, what it decides to do is a function of its character. Just as our Faustian uh, weird uh, destiny idea is that what happens to you is a function of who you are. Same thing with these civilizations. What, what a civilization decides to do uh, is already in advance from its birth limited to what it will do, what it wants to do, and it will only do that which is consistent with the worldview 
that it's trying to construct through its culture period. Uh, different things may happen in the civilization period when that culture sense uh, of a finished cosmology, once it's finished, has become actualized and begins to weaken during the civilization period, and so it may not be the case that it, um, it continues with that and may do other things. But that's the essence of the distinction between the Apollinean and the Faustian uh, desire, as it were, to conquer nature. The Greeks weren't interested in conquering nature, they suffered it. The Faustians have conquered nature. Now, of course, as Spengler talks about in his later book, Man and Technics, uh, we're moving into an, an age of uh, ecological and geological and, and planetary scale catastrophes that industrial civilization has wreaked upon the planet as the result of this Faustian need to conquer the whole thing with, with the technological exoskeleton. And so now we're going to begin to see what the results uh, that will unfold. Uh, Spengler had a glimpse of this, uh, of what would happen in the next couple of centuries, the ecological catastrophes that are now beginning to happen and that will get worse and worse uh, as the decades go on. Uh, Spengler, it wasn't really, um, doesn't prophesy too much about the coming of these ecological catastrophes, although in the last chapter on nature knowledge, he does hint at them. He does say that this can't go on forever. Faustian Technics is doomed by limitations. The planet is not what the Faustian civilization wants, an infinite well of resources that it can then extract in order to build its civilization. There are limits to this, uh, and the limits will gradually be reached, and the Earth's ecosystem, uh, having been tampered with and messed up uh, by all these Faustian uh, greenhouse gases and these Faustian uh, systems, uh, fracking in the Earth, which cause earthquakes, um, all this stuff that Faustian civilization is doing to the Earth uh, will doom it. And you can already see, any, anybody who's, who's a physiognomist, who has the visionary aspect to see this, can see what's coming. It's, it's, it's clear to me uh, that, that what is coming is, is the Faustian bargain. And it, Faust, naming our civilization after Faust, I think, was, was perfect, uh, because the Faustian myth is precisely that, that Faust makes a deal with the devil uh, to get what he wants, in his case, Gretchen first, uh, and later to learn about all the secrets of antiquity and so forth, and then eventually he has to pay the price, and the devil comes to collect his due. In Marlowe's play, it's that way. Uh, Goethe changes the ending so that he actually becomes rewarded uh, rather than having to pay and his soul captured by the devil. Goethe changes the semiotics because he wants to reward the Faustian civilization for its endeavors. That for, for Goethe, um, there are no limits on knowledge, and he wanted to know everything, and he didn't want this myth of Faust, of Faust being damned by Mephistopheles. But he changed the myth, and the original sense of the myth, it was a Protestant myth that came out of uh, Protestant folk culture first, uh, out of plays and festivals. Um, the earliest Faust texts that we have are anonymous before they get to Christopher Marlowe. Uh, Marlowe's is the closer to the original authentic meaning, uh, and Thomas Mann in his novel Dr. Faustus retains that original sense uh, that the devil will come to collect his due eventually. Um, and so that's it for this chapter on the form of the soul. Uh, there are two chapters left in Decline of the West, Volume 1. Buddhism, Stoicism, is, and Socialism is next. And then Nature Knowledge, in which he examines the scientific world picture. Uh, so we'll move into those next.